welcome to iMed Radiology's Where Does It Hurt? Musculoskeletal Webinar Series. So glad you could join us. My name is Sue Clute and I'm an iMed National Marketing Manager for Local Area Marketing and Education. iMed Radiology is proud to present tonight the second of our three-part musculoskeletal webinar series. Tonight's session will feature another of our highly respected radiologists, Dr. Thomas O'Shea. Dr. O'Shea will focus the hour on the diagnosis and subsequent management of common knee complaints in general practice. At iMed Radiology, we have a vision to be the most respected and trusted medical imaging specialists in the world. Our vision is underpinned by our purpose, which is to save lives and reduce uncertainty. We are committed to consistently delivering high quality and expert care in each of our clinics and in every interaction. We are also committed to working with you, our referrers as partners. Tonight's webinar is a prime example of this commitment. This is a commitment that can also be seen from within the patient journey. Did you know your patient can attend an appointment with you via telehealth or face-to-face -face, and the patient's request for imaging can be sent from your practice management software directly to us, safely and securely. The patient receives a text to their phone acknowledging receipt and containing a link to their imaging request. From here, patients in most regions can book their appointment themselves immediately online for a time and date that suits them. Together, these digital initiatives have totally streamlined the process from consultation to request, onto appointment, and importantly, to diagnosis. The patient journey is enhanced and the results are back to you as fast as possible, reducing uncertainty. If you would like more information on these digital initiatives and gaining access to electronic referral or e-referral as we call it, please visit our website, imedradiology.com.au. Speaking of our website, I would like to mention it has a huge amount of resources regarding tonight's topic on musculoskeletal. If you missed the first webinar in this series, you can find the recording. And of course, if you haven't already, you can register for our upcoming third part, the final in this webinar musculoskeletal series. So without further ado, I would like to introduce you to tonight's facilitator, Dr. Philip Perlstein. As a GP, Dr. Perlstein has had a long standing interest in sports medicine and conditions affecting the musculoskeletal system. In 1988, he founded Midtown Medical Clinic in Melbourne. And in 1993, co-founded the Melbourne Sports Medicine Centre. Prior to the existence of the Sports and Exercise Physician Fellowship, Dr. Perlstein completed the one year sports medicine course run jointly at that time at the, by the Australian Sports Medicine Federation and the RACGP. He served for several years on the Victorian Panel of Examiners for the Postgraduate Fellowship of RACGP and has been involved with the North Melbourne and Carlton Football Clubs, but we won't hold that against him. He's worked at a doc, as a doctor at the 2000 Olympics and he's been a member of the selection panel for the Monash Medical Students and been involved as a tutor of undergraduate students at Monash University Department of General Practice. Today, Dr. Pearlstein remains active with both his founding practices at Midtown Medical and the Melbourne Sports Medicine Centre, primarily in a management and mentoring role. Before I hand over to Dr. Pearlstein, I do have a few housekeeping items just to mention. If you have any questions, please send those through during the chat, through the chat during the presentation, and we will answer as many questions as possible. If we don't get to all of them, we will do a Q&A of the most frequently asked questions and add this to our website. At the conclusion of the webinar, please be sure to stay online to complete your evaluation form. Your feedback is really important. This allows us to continue to improve these education sessions. We are focused on keeping these sessions as relevant and as informative as possible. So suggestions for future content um, and feedback in general is really important to us. I will now hand over to Dr. Perlstein as he's going to introduce our guest speaker for tonight, 
Dr. Thomas O'Shea. Thank you. Thanks, Sue. Uh, good evening, everybody. It's a great pleasure to know that so many of my colleagues uh, uh, participating in this night. Um, you don't need me to tell you that uh, musculoskeletal problems are very common in general practice and that we do see a lot of people presenting with knee pain, uh, regardless of their demographic across all age groups. So this is very relevant to us all. And uh, I hope that you will be able to participate by asking questions of Thomas uh, and he'll be able to assist with answering them. A few words about Thomas O'Shea. He's a general diagnostic radiologist with considerable experience uh, in musculoskeletal MRI and ultrasound. Uh, he's also experienced in interventional radiology and the areas of mus in the areas of musculoskeletal and spinal procedures. Um, he's very big on skiing and tells me he had a wonderful day last Thursday. Uh, and he's a member of the Victorian Ski, Ski Patrol Association, a volunteer paramedic at the Mount Buller Ski Patrol, and a lecturer for the Australian Ski Patrol Association. Our practice is among, is among many of the practices in Melbourne who are fortunate to have access to his expertise in assisting our patients. Uh, so thanks, Thomas, for your presentation this evening. Thanks, Phil. Thanks for those kind words and thanks to everyone for tuning in tonight. Um, I'm honoured to be here and um, talking to you. Let's launch into it. So David Beckham, the clinician, he's got knee pain on the left of the screen. Dave Beckham's taking a clinical history on the right of the screen. He's doing a thorough clinical examination. But what scan will David Beckham get? So if Bex tunes into our webinar tonight, you can learn all about that in the image. It's a very, very simple talk. We're going to go through each modality that you have as referrers at your fingertips as tools to solve people's knee problems. Um, we'll go through some clinical imaging flowcharts at the end. And then throughout, we'll show some common pathologies that I see every day practicing uh, and hopefully uh, use some radiology jargon to get you more familiar as to how to interpret our reports and questions throughout directed to Phil um, or we'll um, address them at the end hopefully if time permits. The first modality, it's the simplest and it's the most or the lowest tech but in certain situations it's one of the most important um, modalities we have as the knee x-ray. Okay, so the three main uses for knee x-ray are for trauma, for acute fracture, um, characterization or exclusion, for arthritis and for bone tumors. Um, it's also used uh, infrequently for looking for infection, for osteomyelitis and for post-operative care. Now the beauty of the x-ray, even though it's so low tech, we get a really good overview of the whole joint instead of looking through a CT or MRI where all of the pictures are stacked on top of each other, everything is compressed. So we see the whole bone and joint. And as radiologists, we're taught pattern So I think our cycle patterns that we can only really appreciate if at X-ray. Pardon me. Um, also, bone tumors, we always start with a primary x ray because pattern recognition, certain patterns of ossification, calcification, what the periosteum is doing and what's, the, what's happening to the bone are best shown uh, in the x ray. You don't need an appointment, you can send your patient straight down with the slip and it's relatively inexpensive. So, it's a good starting point for most knee problems. This is a standard um, series that you'll expect out of a knee x-ray. Um, on the top left, call this the patella skyline view. So if you're looking down at your patella standing up, um, that's with x-ray vision, that's what you'll see. If you look at the patella, it's got a long lateral facet and a shorter medial facet. The V at the bottom of the medial lateral facet is called the patella median eminence. Okay, 
and across the, the cartilage, across the joint is the femoral trochlea. So technically it's the patellotrochlear joint, but we, we refer to it as the patellofemoral joint. The trochlea has a lateral and medial facet and the central trochlear groove. If you look at the bottom left, we'll see um, the intercondylar notch view. And so we, we take the X-ray parallel to the joint surfaces and this is really good for looking at joint space narrowing. The, um, you can see on the left of the picture, there is actually narrowing of that um, medial joint compartment compared to the lateral. So we're showing some indicative of chondral wear. And then standard X-ray series in the middle is the lateral. And then on the right is the frontal or AP projection. So um, one, one key thing with looking at arthritis is we do a weight bearing x-ray. So same patient, um, same knee, on the left it's a supine non weight bearing x-ray and um, you get the false sense of there's still some cartilage in this osteoarthritic knee. But on the right weight bearing you can see the lateral compartment. Uh, there's no space there, so that's bone on bone. So the X-ray has been really helpful in showing this is the advanced osteoarthritis of that lateral compartment. So you don't really need to be an expert in picking the major fractures. Uh, this is a nasty tibial condylar, tibial plateau fracture. This is a pediatric fracture of the femoral condyle and um, and growth plate. But the X-ray sometimes helps us find uh, more serious injuries. And uh, radiologists were taught pattern recognition. Okay, so let's, let's cross over to the first dynamic pole question. Um, the, we're looking at the lateral X-ray on the left and the frontal X-ray on the right. Now on the lateral, the, there's a little notch or little indentation to the lateral femoral condyle, the black arrow. We call that the deep lateral sulcus sign. And on the right, the AP projection, there's a little flake avulsion, a little bit of bone that's been pulled off from the lateral tibial condyle called a second fracture. So it doesn't look like much, but the radiologist rings and says, I think you've injured the, uh, over to you. Um, let's see if, if I can work this. Okay, you've got, Have you got the uh, the bowl now, or I might go to Troy, the moderator, to see if this works. So a choice of four. So let's see what happens. Poll is open, I'm told. Okay, so let's close the poll. And the answer is, this is associated with an ACL injury. So the, what's happened is if you look at uh, the knee side on, is the femoral condyle, it's here. The ACL, when we do the clinical assessment for a loose ACL is the anterior draw test. Okay, the ACL keeps the tibia in place, the ACL has ruptured with an acute injury and the back of the tibia has impacted on the femoral condyle, giving the deep sulcus sign. And as it's gone forward and twisted, the joint capsule has pulled off a flake of the bone of the lateral tibial condyle. So the X-ray has been really helpful here in showing a, uh, a more serious injury, the ACL. Um, do we get the results, Troy? Does that pop up? As I can see it, uh, let's have a look. There we go. I think it was in natural coverage for the human injury. Yeah. Um, <coughs> And 
I did. Oh, I'm jumping ahead. So here's another fairly yeah, uh, decent looking x ray uh, with no fracture on, on site, but we've got a funny line in the suprapatellar pouch. This x ray has been taken uh, with the patient lying down because they can't ambulate. Kneecap to the front is a lateral x ray, and we've got a fluid fluid level. And so what this is, it's a lipohemarthrosis. Uh, we've got a nasty fracture somewhere and bone marrow or oil is spilling out into the joint. Um, and the low density black oil of the marrow layers on the blood. So radiologist rings up and says, I think you've got a nasty fracture here. Let's do something else, probably CT or, um, or MRI. And the MRI, in this case is actually really pretty. We've got actually two lines. We've got the right red arrow shows the interface between the oil and the serum. And then the blood is actually sedimenting out into serum on, in the middle and the hematocrit, the red blood cells layering on the bottom. You actually get a three level uh, sort of sediment on the MRI, it's very pretty. And this person had a tibial um, condylar fracture. Okay, and I said bone tumors always start off with an x ray for bone tumors. Uh, on the left, we've got a nasty bone forming osteosarcoma. And on the right, we've got a, a lucent, a black um, hole um, centrally in the tibial plateau, the tibial condyle. And um, so it's a, a, a metastatic um, or yeah, lithic metastasis from breast cancer. Okay, thumbs up, Phil. Is, that, is my audio okay? Uh, Phil, uh, it's not, it's not great. great. I think the audio is not great. I think they might swap you to the phone, would be a good idea. Okay. through x-ray in summary x-ray is good for acute fracture um, arthritis bone tumors now MRI will spend a fair bit of time here because most new imaging is MRI and it's the most complicated um, there's no radiation to MRI and it's the best overall modality for knees because it's fantastic for soft tissue injuries ligaments tendons it's great for cartilage um, it shows the, the bone marrow for fractures and injuries, etc. Uh, it's not all perfect. There are limitations to MRI. 
Uh, firstly, it's quite a lengthy scan to acquire. It takes about 20 minutes to do one knee. Um, people with metal in their knee, the images can be degraded. It's not a contraindication, but it can actually affect diagnostic quality. Um, patient claustrophobia is an issue. We'll talk about that in just a minute. And then there's certain safety um, considerations and contraindications. We'll get to that. So poll question number two, MRI safety question. Which of the following is not safe for MRI? So over to the audience for participation. We'll give you about 20 seconds. And let's close it there. And yep, everyone switched on. 81% um, got the correct answer, cochlear implant. And then um, a few people were um, pretty keen on the knee replacement. Um, a few people were talking about vasectomy because actually pretty even spread with all the, the rest of it. Um, the first thing I'll say is that if anyone has any safety questions, call your local clinic um, and talk to the MRI tech or your radiologist. There's three main um, factors about MRI safety. Um, first of all, it's a really strong magnetic field. So any, any loose metallic ferromagnetic body can potentially move in the body. So we're talking people with shrapnel, people who um, do metal grinding without um, protective safety um, gear on their eyes. And the metal can move and cause a, a shearing uh, injury to the local tissue. Uh, so if someone has a history of metal grinding, we always do an X-ray that we organize as a safety thing to make sure there's no metallic foreign body. So movement for a joint prosthesis, uh, we usually leave about six to eight weeks post-op before we're, we're happy to put them in the magnet. And then most orthopedic um, fixation after six weeks is generally safe for MRI. It doesn't move, it's osteo-integrated into the body. Um, second factor is heating. So we use a magnetic field to generate the MRI, but the MRI talks to the tissues using radio waves and they're sort of like low energy microwaves. And when you put metal in your microwave, it heats up and it sparks. So certain um, wiring and metallic um, items can heat up. Things like um, uh, endoluminal vascular grass for AAA, uh, etc. etc. Uh, the third thing is the magnetic field can um, denature or de uh, disable electronic devices. So the correct answer here is the cochlear implant can't go into the MRI. Um, other things like cardiac defib, cardiac pacemakers or certain pacemakers, some are now safe, uh, et cetera. If you have any questions, call us up, we'll go through it. And obviously every patient who goes anywhere near an MRI gets a thorough safety questionnaire uh, and vetting. But the earlier you can flag these issues, the better for us. Here's our um, MRI uh, Vic House in Melbourne, um, IMED. And you can see here, I want, want to go through this question or this, this picture because when um, we have claustrophobic patients, it's really good for the referrers to explain to people just how, uh, how it works. So she's got earphones on and she can choose whatever music she wants. In her right hand, she's got a, a little safety buzzer so at any time if she wants to stop or talk to the tech, she can push the button. And then on her right knee, this is a surface coil, okay? And this is um, as close as the machine can get to talk to the tissues in her right knee. And every now and then you'll see one of our reports that says uh, surface coil could not be used due to patient body habitus, okay? If someone's too big to fit into the surface coil, the next closest um, coils are in the table that the patient's lying in, or they're actually in the, um, the MRI unit. We don't get as good a scan if we don't use the surface coil, but we still get really good diagnostic pictures. So that, uh, that breaks down that, uh, that type of you know, line that you'll see in the report. Um, 
when someone goes into the magnet for a knee, ankle, hip, they go in feet first. So you can see most of their head is partially sticking out. So if someone's claustrophobic, you can reassure them that they'll go in feet first and you know most of their head's looking out so they won't feel as uh, as trapped in as say a head scan or um, or a body scan um, and lastly you can reassure them you can tell your patient that you'll have a qualified tech watching over them for the entire duration of the scan and you're wired up with a little microphone you can they talk to each other throughout the scan um, so um, someone will help them through it Audience poll question. Okay, this is uh, rather important. So uh, what is the adult age bracket for a Medicare rebatable MRI knee scan coming from a GP? I'll put this in because we get a lot of patients coming in expecting a rebate. And unfortunately, the rules are the rules. And uh, when they get told no, it's uh, it's pretty frustrating. Um, so if it, let's give you a few more seconds and then we'll close the poll. Three, two, one. And good to see 42% of the audience, 43% got the correct answer. Most people went for six, uh, 16 to 50. But then also 31% went for 16 and older. Okay. And some people, 22% got 18 to 50. So this is really important. Let's go back to the answer. The answer is 16 to less than 50. Um, when, so the pediatric cutoff is 16. Um, the government says after 16 years, you're now classified as an adult for the for the Medicare ruling. And initially it was 16 and older, but then they racked it back for me to 16 to 50, okay? You can still have uh, the rebate for head and C-spine for 16 to any age group, okay? But for knees, they were worried too many arthritic knees out there and old people were getting MRI, not X-ray. So they racked it back to 49, and 364 days, okay. Um, the rebate, to get the rebate, we need a referral to um, talk about acute knee trauma. Now the definition of acute is a bit uh, wishy-washy. The, um, the government hasn't um, clarified that. So acute, semi-acute knee trauma, um, with a query of a meniscal tear or an acute ACL tear and that will um, provide the Medicare rebate. For the paediatric age group, it's less than 16. Um, you need to do a normal x-ray first, so start with an x-ray series, and it's a bit looser. It's a query internal joint derangement. You don't need to, you can put query meniscus, query ACL, or you can say query internal joint derangement. Now, MRI is super complicated. It's the most advanced um, technique we have. But I want to give you the simple version of how to read MRI. And it starts with the question I get all the time, which is why are all the pictures, or well, half the pictures black? And I can't see what's going on in the scan, okay? And uh, it starts with this jargon. It's a silly question, but it's going to have a really good sort of uh, good teaching point. So on the top of the, um, the scan you get here, we've got core PD, core PDFS. Now, I wanna put it over to you. Here we go, audience, participation. What does core PDFS mean? And here's your, uh, here's your chance to shine. Oh, wrong question. And you're not being surveilled, so if you don't know and don't care, you're not going to lose any CME points. Okay, we've only got. Okay, here we go. All right, we'll give you five more seconds for three. Two, one, and we'll close it there. And 
that's fantastic actually. The majority of people got it right, 64% coronals, proton density, fat saturation. And um, I was expecting more people to not know or not care. But uh, let's go back to presentation. So MRI is about planes and colors. And a radiologist, quite often, we, uh, we prescribe um, a specific MRI based on what planes we want to see the pathology. And that's pretty simple for the knee. You get axial, looking from top down. This is coronal, looking from front to back. And then the sagittal is like the lateral X-ray, looking from the side on. And then for, for joint imaging, we predominantly use a sequence called proton density or PD. It's the best for looking at cartilage. It's a really good, uh, really good workhorse for most of the joints. And proton is a is a hydrogen atom, right? So we're doing a, a an, yeah. So proton, an MRI, is a scan of hydrogen atoms, and we're looking at the density of hydrogen through the body and the composition of the hydrogen. And where do we find hydrogen in the body? We find it in water. H2O, so that's fluid. We find it in fat. If you remember back to med school, all of those organic chemistry lectures of the carbon chains, all the hydrogens coming off like a centipede, that's your fat. And so a PD, a proton density scan, is a fat and a fluid scan. So on the left, um, we've got the normal PD, okay? And the fat and the fluid is bright or it's white. And I call this the anatomy scan. So the anatomy scan, we get beautiful anatomy, but I always start looking at the black one, which is a PD fat sat, or it should be called fat suppression. We've turned the fat signal off, that goes black, and we're left with whatever's bright is water or fluid. And I call this the pathology scan. So we start looking at the black, the pathology scan, because a lot of pathology, um, turns up with water, with edema and swelling. And um, so in this case on the right, we've turned the skin fat, the subcutaneous fat black, the bottom arrow, and we've turned the marrow into a black signal. And over on the, the right side of the picture, we've got the iliotibial band coursing down vertically and it's rubbing on the lateral femoral epicondyle. And we've got soft tissue edema where it's rubbing. So this is iliotibial band friction syndrome, and we're seeing it on the pathology scan. Okay, let's let's take the lesson a bit further. This is an acute ACL injury, and I'm always starting looking at the the PD fat sat, the pathology scan, and the two arrows are showing bright signal, so water or edema, um, so so bone bruising of the lateral femoral condyle, that's the top arrow, and we're showing edema bone bruising of the posterior corner of the lateral tibial condyle on this sagittal sequence. And also all of that white blob at the top beneath the, uh, the patella, that's a big effusion. So the, so the fluid pathology scan, scan is showing us a big effusion and some bone marrow edema in those parts. So when we go over to anatomy scan, the PD on top left, in the midline on the sagittal, where the ACL, where the arrow is showing, that's been completely ruptured, a grade three injury. And then when we look at the sagittal PD for anatomy, I can see a tiny little curved black line beneath the um, subchondral bone plate. I'm seeing a little fracture. So the Edema is then taking me over to the PD, the anatomy scan, where we actually see what's going on for real. This is a sagittal, so I've got the PD and the PD fat sat. We've got anatomy on the left and the pathology scan on the right. And so the right scan, the arrow showing bone edema. When we look at the anatomy scan, we're not really seeing much. It actually looks pretty normal. So we've got a bone bruise or bone contusion with no fracture. If we look at the posterior aspect of the tibial condyle, we've got uh, on the right, we've got bright signal, 
So we've got something going on there. We've got bone marrow edema. When I look on the left on the anatomy scan, we've got this coarsened um, uh, appearance to the trabecular, to the medullary bone. And this is a microtrabecular fracture. So you'll, you'll hear radiologists talk about, first of all, a, a bone bruise, okay? And then secondly, you'll hear them talk about a microtrabecular fracture or some call it an infraction, okay? These settle down usually within two to three weeks um, after injury. If we look at this case here, same, um, um, same plane, sagittal. On the right, we've got the PD fat sets. This is my pathology um, scan. Um, and we've got three lots of bone marrow edema in the lateral um, femoral condyle at the top. We've got the tibial condyle in the middle, and we've got the fibular head now with bone marrow edema. And you'll agree, you can't really appreciate what's going on. So we start with the fat set, and now if we look over onto the, um, the PD, the anatomy scan, we've got fractures of the femoral condyle and of the fibular head. And we've got a microtrabecular fracture, that coarsening of the, of the honeycomb of the bone with no fracture. So microtrabecular fracture of the tibial condyle. Um, let's have a look at meniscal tears. And um, they're really, really complicated to describe, but the top three meniscal tears, I just made this little prop here. I want to talk about the bucket handle tear, and I just took a post-it note and I made a meniscus. So if you're looking at an axial scan, there's a meniscus like a little horseshoe. And if you were to load or punch down onto that meniscus with the femoral condyle, you split the meniscus. This is a bucket handle tear, okay? And when the, the bucket handle component of the meniscus flips, we've got a bucket handle with a flipped, with a flipped fragment, okay? And that goes into the middle of the joint and it can cause catching and notching, okay? So that's the bucket handle tear. At imaging, you can see, looking at a coronal scan, coronal PD fat sack, the small arrow, shows a very small stripped out body of the of the meniscus and the bigger arrow shows the bucket handle component of the tear which is flipped over and is now sitting in the intercondylar notch so this can cause catching and locking okay it's the bucket handle uh, next next meniscus or so meniscal tear is a radial tear okay here's a here's another meniscus i made all right and a radial tear is pretty Pretty simple. If we cut radially, that's a partial radial tear. Okay. Now this one here, so I'd say inner half of the body of the meniscus, but still intact. If I call it a complete radial tear, that's a potential disaster because the meniscus is now it's lost its hoop strength. So that's an orthopedic, that's an orthopedic injury uh, needs to be. The type of radial tear that you may also hear radiologists talk about is a parrot beak tear. So it's like a radial tear, it then goes around a corner. And when the surgeons look into their scope, they see it's like a little parrot beak. I don't know if you can see that, the curved radial tear. Okay. Um, now, looking at this uh, axial PD, the arrow at the nine o'clock position is showing the radial tear. So it's a little linear white line cutting through the cutting through the meniscus. And on the sagittal, you can imagine uh, the, cut, the cut just goes straight through the body of the lateral meniscus there, causing that vertical white line. The most common tear that we, uh, we see is a flap tear. Okay, so I've taken my post-it note. Here's the meniscus. And if we look at it from sagittal, I'll put actually two post-it notes together. And the bottom one, I've made a little flap. And I'm gonna fold it over like that. Okay. You can see there's a flap underneath the body of this meniscus. All right. And most of them are just torn, but not flipped. 
but occasionally it slips out and it goes off into the into the paramuniscal gutter. So this uh, this sagittal PD fat fat image is showing a at the apex of the arrow. It's showing a little white line coursing underneath the posterior horn of this meniscus. That's an undisplaced flat tear. We're looking at coronal here, so front on, and you can see the flap tear now has the flip. So the the, uh, the right arrow, which is um, horizontal, you can see there's a black blob, which is extending out into the uh, medial joint line. And on the pathology scan on the, the PD fat set, we've got white edema surrounding the joint capsule and MCL. So we've got an irritated medial joint line. So this was symptomatic for a, um, a medial meniscal tear. Chondral injuries, MRI is uh, superior for looking at cartilage. So on the left, the coronal PD fat set, we're seeing bone marrow edema of the lateral femoral condyle. And if we zoom in on the sagittal PD, you can see the arrow is pointing to a thin black line underneath the lateral femoral condyle. That's the subchondral bone plate. And then beneath that, there's a defect in the cartilage. So we've, we've, we've sheared off a chunk of cartilage. This is an acute transchondral injury. But importantly, the subchondral bone plate's intact. So this is a transchondral injury compared to an osteochondral injury or, or chronically osteochondral defect. So on the left, um, this is showing there's a chunk of bone, including the subchondral bone plate. And quite often the, uh, the cartilage overlying it is intact, but we've got water signal. So white, bright water signal undermining that bone fragment. So this is an unstable osteochondral defect. On the right, a very uh, skillful surgeon has fixed that back in place and the uh, patient did really well. Chondromalacia, very quickly, um, you'll hear us talking about grading of chondromalacia. We use a modified outer bridge system. This is axial, PD fat set, looking from the top down. We're looking at the patella articular cartilage. And this is a normal, nice, thick patella cartilage outlined with bright white uh, fluid um, in, the, uh, in the joint. Um, Phil, uh, do you have a question? Yeah, somebody has asked, uh, Stephen's asked a good question. How well do the MRI findings on meniscal injuries correlate with the surgical findings subsequently if they proceed to operation? Yeah, good question, thanks Steve. Um, I don't have any um, exact numbers at hand, but we work pretty care uh, closely with the orthopedic surgeons and we have multidisciplinary meetings and it's pretty good. Um, MRI is actually pretty sharp, um, especially the newer sort of uh, the newer magnets. Um, the description of the meniscal tear can sometimes vary depending on the radiologist reading it. Um, but the majority of the uh, radiologists can communicate the standard meniscal tears really accurately to the to the surgeons. So we do have good correlation. It's a bit hard when the um, meniscal injuries become chronic um, or in the post-operative setting. Uh, it's a bit of a, um, uh, it makes it a bit more uh, difficult. Um, so quickly going through the chondromalacia, this is grade zero or normal cartilage. I just wanted to show grade one is just softening. We just get a subtle um, signal change in the, the cartilage. Now grade two at the Median eminence, we've got partial thickness fissuring. So you can see irregular sort of uh, cartilage overlying the V of the, of the patella. Grade three is partial to near um, full thickness chondral fissuring, but there's no um, bony change. Then grade four, we have full thickness fissuring or chondral wear and then marrow changes. So this is a subchondral fibrocyst. Um, this case also has osteophytes, so it's osteoarthritis. And in the effusion, there's synovial fronding, this sort of uh, wispy spiderweb um, uh, appearance in the joint fluid, that's synovitis. So that's quite an advanced OA of the patellofemoral joint. 
Um, ligaments, MRI is, is fantastic. Um, this is a coronal PD, so showing the anatomy of a completely ruptured um, MCL, and it's sort of uh, retracted like a rubber band, okay? Here's another, um, the opposite knee, uh, or different knee counterpart, showing the anatomy sequence, and the MCL is beautifully taut and intact, okay? But when we look at the pathology sequence, PD fat sat, we've got lots of white signal, so edema surrounding the MCL. This is a grade one MCL sprain, but the structure of the MCL is intact. So we're using the pathology sequence and the anatomy sequence together. Okay, moving on to ultrasound. Um, it's, uh, it's used for niche indications in the knee. The, the rule of ultrasound basically for me is if you can put a finger on where the patient's problem is, we can put the ultrasound probe there, okay? We can't access deep into the knee. Um, this complicated slide uh, is the HIC guidelines to get a um, Medicare rebate. And for us to be able to rebate a patient, we need a specific structure or specific problem to be targeted at the ultrasound. So knee swelling or knee pain um, doesn't qualify for a rebate. We have to have a, a specific targeted question regarding a tendon, a bursa, a cyst, uh, a nerve, etc. Okay, and as a result, we want good clinical information for an, a knee ultrasound because it's operator dependent, and um, we're going to target the uh, target the scan as opposed to a holistic MRI scan. Um, it, Ultrasound is really good for uh, for tendons, and it's probably got the probably the best for um, tendons compared to MRI, CT, etc. The one advantage is we've got Doppler. So on the top, we've got a normal-looking patella tendon. On the left, the bright line is the patella, the kneecap, and the normal tendon at ultrasound has a ropey, striated or stripy appearance. And when a tendon becomes tendinopathic, you get a uh, mucoid uh, matrix laid down between the collagen of the, um, the tendon. So the tendon swells, gets bulky, and it becomes black and blobby on the ultrasound. So the bottom picture shows a, a, a thickened, boggy tendon, which is tendinopathy. Um, this is a really severe patella tendinosis, a black, thickened tendon. And the bottom, um, the bottom, uh, picture is showing Doppler and all of that color is blood flow um, which is the body growing blood vessel so neovascularity into the tendon to try and heal it but paradoxically it can actually weaken the tendon um, so ultrasound strengths it's really high resolution for superficial structures it's dynamic we interact with the patient uh, but the limitations, it's not a holistic scan looking deep into the knee. So there are blind spots and it's operator dependent. So the more information you can give us for uh, knee ultrasound, I think the better uh, we'll, uh, we'll do of the job. It's really good for looking at um, cysts. Uh, so Baker's cyst, uh, looking at bursae. So fluid is black on ultrasound. This is showing a big Baker's cyst. And we use it for image guided procedures. So we use a sterile uh, probe cover over, uh, over all our probes with IMED. Um, so it's totally sterile. And here on the top left, we're draining a Baker cyst. And on the bottom, we're um, infiltrating plasma through a tendinopathic patella tendon. CT, CT is, uh, well, first of all, just you can see the difference of CT, the gantry is much more open and it's much shorter compared to MRI. So there's very uh, few people who have claustrophobic problems with that. It's also a much quicker scan. It goes through the, uh, the scan in, in a matter of seconds. And you always have a tech watching over you at all times in the scan. So the, the main use of CT is for surgical planning, fracture detection. Um, for, and then there's a few niche applications. So you may be recommended a CT working up a bone uh, bone tumor post X-ray. Um, 
for patellofemoral maltracking issues. There's a certain protocol we can use for that, usually from the um, orthopedic surgeons. And then if someone has an MRI contraindication, they can't have MRI, very rarely we do a CT arthrogram where we inject contrast into the knee and we look and uh, it's sort of like a, a substitute MRI looking at cartilage and uh, menisci. So CT is really good for fracture characterization. Top left, we've got a subtle uh, tibial condyla, tibial plateau fracture. And on the CT, it shows it beautifully. Um, good for surgical planning. This is a CT arthrogram. So the white, the bright white uh, um, substance is contrast. It's been injected under ultrasound. And then we've taken the patient over and done a, uh, done a CT. And you can see beautifully, the, um, the bottom arrows are pointing to the black, dark menisci that don't have any contrast in them. And we've got the top arrows pointing to the gray um, cartilage of the, uh, of the knee joint. So that looks pretty normal there. But you can see in this case here, we've got the, cart or the, uh, the contrast extruding into the meniscal tears. Okay, so this is something you could talk to your radiologist about if you've got someone with uh, potential knee problems, meniscal injury, um, who can't have an MRI. Nuclear medicine, now this, um, this is a game changer. Um, we'll finish up on the nukes. And I wanna show um, a new development, which is really cool. Um, niche indications, we use it for joint prosthesis, looking for loosening or infection. That's probably the most, uh, most common indication for doing the, the nuclear medicine scan. Um, for subtle insufficiency or stress fractures that really they go to MRI, but if someone's contraindicated for MRI, and then for working up bone um, bone lesions, METs or primary bone tumours. So uh, nuclear medicine used to be quite low resolution and low tech. We used to call it the dots because you get these dotty two-dimensional images. But this is the new age nuclear medicine scan, which is the SPECT CT. And it's really clever, it's two scans in one. So you can see on the left, you have a patient lying in what's looking like a sandwich press at the front, and you've got a sort of a standard CT scanner at the back, okay? So um, the SPECT CT scanner, the sandwich press, is the bone scan component, and that um, now scans over 10 to 15 minutes. It rotates around the patient and does a three, 3D bone scan, which is the first revolution. The second, advance is then the patient has the bone scan and gets a non-contrast CT scan through the same region. So for example, in the knee, they get their SPECT 3D bone scan to the left and they get the CT scan on the right. We put them together, we get a SPECT CT scan. So this person with a knee prosthesis had anterior knee pain. We weren't sure if it was loosening of the prosthesis, infection, when we did the SPECT CT, you can see all the activity <clears throat> is the patellar articular surface. So this is just progressive OA of the native patella, uh, and the prosthesis was fine. So we're getting function from the bone scan, and we're getting structure uh, or beautiful anatomy and uh, resolution from the, from the co-registered CT. So this SPECT CT scan, unfortunately, now we've got all of the signal um, outlining the margin of the femoral component of the knee prosthesis. So this is actually infection or loosening. Um, so we've got structure and function together. Fantastic. So this is called SPECT CT. And you'll agree the scanning has come a long way compared with the two-dimensional dots. So that's all the uh, modalities. Very quickly, I'll just give you the, uh, the clinical imaging flow charts. This summarizes what we've all uh, we've been talking about. So internal derangement, start with an MRI. MRI is the best overall scan for the knee. If it's an acute fracture concern, obviously start with an X-ray. Um, anterior knee pain or patellofemoral, start with an X-ray looking for arthritis in the elderly, or MRI, the best overview. Uh, for a fracture, 
start with an X-ray. And then if we find an X, uh, find a fracture, you might go on to CT. If the X-ray is negative, you may go on to MRI. Suspected bone tumor, start with X-ray. Then a radiologist will usually recommend a second line imaging. Usually we go on to contrast MRI. Occasionally we'll want to see the matrix with CT or work it up with a, with a bone scan. Um, bone scan is good for metastatic disease. Tendinopathy, if you can put a finger on where the pain is and it's superficial, we can do a targeted ultrasound. So patella tendon, quadricep tendon. And remember, tendinopathy ultrasound has the advantage of Doppler looking for the end stage of the neovascularity. Um, Baker cyst ultrasound um, and image guided procedures for me will usually use ultrasound. So ultrasound is good for aspiration and injection. Um, and in summary, we talked about x-ray, really good for acute fractures, essential for arthritis, um, essential for bone tumours. MRI is mostly our go-to um, sequence or modality for knee pain. And then ultrasound, CT and nuclear medicine for niche applications. And I think it's time for questions. Over to Phil. Thanks, Thomas. Uh, that was uh, really interesting. I've written down a whole lot of questions I wanted to ask you. Unfortunately, I've crossed most of them out on the way. Other people have uh, uh, asked a few questions. Um, and also, uh, I suppose we should apologise that there's been some technical issues. You're just going to expect that when you've got, uh, you know, over 300 people on uh, locked up at home on on uh, computers trying to make it all work. But I think most of us have a very meaningful experience. Thank you. Um, I guess uh, one of the things that I was going to ask about was, uh, the, you, you touched on it with ultrasound, but the importance of clinical information that you receive so that you get if you know if you get a good history and and get some examination findings with a query this query meniscal tear query ACL rupture I'm sure that must make it much a much more rewarding experience for uh, the GP the radiologist and the patient to get the best response yeah absolutely Phil uh, we want to make every day we want to make the best reports for the clinicians and for you know the patients behind them the more information we get, the more relevant the report will be. And um, I don't like to say the, the saying rubbish in, rubbish out. I think it's more rubbish in, varying shade of wonderful out. <laughs> um, mm -hmm. uh, the more you can help us uh, and direct uh, the attention to what's relevant will make a really good report for you, hopefully. Also, I think the relationship we have uh, certainly in our practice in Melbourne, we've got a really close working relationship with our clinicians and we're on the phone half the time throughout the day with uh, a two-way dynamic relationship. Lots of questions come to us and we ring up and um, a lot of questions back to the referrers. So um, I think we want to foster that relationship. Yeah. I think that makes a massive difference for everybody. Um, also, there's a question by Sue from Sue. Is there any place for the old type bone scan anymore? The dot? Yeah, um, what we usually do, um, so for metastatic disease, bone scan's really, really good. Um, so if we, if we have a suspicious bone lesion or if there's a diagnosis of um, malignancy, we do a 2D bone scan and anything that lights up these days, the nuclear medicine tech will take that to the radiologist and say, oh, do you want to spec this? If it's anything sus or if they need to, they'll go on and do the spec. So that does the 3D nuclear medicine scan. And then they can also do the CT with that as well. But yeah, probably metastatic disease, we usually do a 2D and if it's all normal, we end there. Yeah. Thanks, Thomas. Um, Jurek asks, if you suspect a Baker's cyst and therefore you suspect an internal derangement, wouldn't it be beneficial to do an MRI to see what's creating the cyst instead of an ultrasound? Yeah, yeah, for sure. And I always talk about the Baker cyst being the tip of the iceberg. So yeah. if, if the Baker cyst is symptomatic, so some people come in and they have a lot of pressure and it's really causing them pain and they want ultrasound and plus or minus drainage, um, ultrasound is good for that. And we put a bit of cortisone in. 
but tip of the iceberg, if it's not the Baker cyst that's a problem, it's generalised knee pain, swelling, um, get an MRI and, um, you know, if it's synovitis, we can drain the Baker cyst, but sometimes the cortisone going into the knee joint is a better, better target for the cortisone to stop the fluid from reaccumulating and then filling the Baker cyst up again. But yeah, I'd recommend an MRI um, if it's a generalised generalized um, irritable knee for sure. Okay, now Paul asks, do they still describe the sequences as T1 and T2? I must confess that was going through my mind. Mm. Or is it now PD and PDFS? And when would you use a STIR sequence? Yep, excellent. Um, that's really good. Sorry for confusing you. So we still use T1, we still use T2. Uh, and we use them a lot in the spine. PD, proton density, we find is the best for joint imaging because cartilage looks really, really good. Cartilage has got water in it, it's sort of bright, and it's a nice texture, really, at, at, on PD, at MR. So we still can use T1 and in, um, in some people or some practices protocol a T1 in their musculoskeletal um, scanning. The, um, the STIR sequence, um, is really, really, really sensitive for bone marrow edema. So if you want to ramp ramp up our pathology sequence, STIR is really good for that, but it's a bit um, less resolution. And we find the PD fat sat is our really good pathology sequence. It picks up enough of the bone marrow edema and the soft tissue edema. Um, I, I don't want you to get too complicated or too hung up on the sequences. Um, the radiologist, are always changing and, and and tweaking. That's our job and the tech's job to uh, to get the best sequences for each joint. I just wanted you to think about what an MRI scan is, so you can explain it to your patients. And I wanted you to have a an approach on how to look at the scans with your patients. So I'd suggest you look at the the pathology sequence, the black sequence first, where fluid is bright and fat is dark, and then when you find something that lights up go over to the, the same sequence in just the, the, the anatomy where the fat is bright and see if you can see a fracture or see if you can see a lesion there and um, and they work together, yeah. And also, um, in the reporting, there's sometimes some variability from radiologist to radiologist about how meniscal injuries are described. For instance, uh, you know, meniscal tears compared to the meniscal degeneration, you know, with an injury in a, you know, 25 year old compared to a 65 year old who's got knee pain. Um, yeah. Can you make a comment about that? Yeah, it, it can sometimes be hard. I, I teach the fellows in our practice. Um, I talk about our meniscal, uh, uh, I try and classify the meniscal tear to what best fits because I think talking about it as a flat tear, radial tear, bucket handle tear, et cetera, you can then communicate that to the surgeon and the surgeon knows what they're, what they're looking at because that's what they see on the, in the scope. So I try and encourage our trainees to try and best classify it. But sometimes it's hard. The meniscal tear can be a bit sort of uh, wishy-washy or a bit sort of degenerate. And sometimes we don't know and we can't and we say it's a degenerate multi-directional tear. Um, or another way of just saying the meniscus is really, really just, you know, um, I won't say anything more on that, but we try our best to, to put it into a classification. And, you know, radiologists, um, we're all different, we're all human, we'll describe it slightly differently. So you might have one person describe it slightly differently, but you need to um, know your radiologist and know how they report. And, um, and then if you have any questions, the first thing is call the radiologist who made the report, pick their brain, and they might be um, happy to review the report and then add an addendum. If you're not happy, you can always get a second opinion by ringing up um, an IMED clinic, same clinic, and uh, see if someone else is on. Yeah. Thank you. The, the, the last question I've got here is uh, from one of the physiotherapists, and I know we have quite a few uh, physiotherapists that, uh, that uh, take part in these discussions, which is very appropriate. Um, the question is, are there any situations which allow for a Medicare rebate for near MRI referral from a physi physiotherapist? 
not yet. Um, we were really lucky to get the, first of all, the paediatric indication. That was a really big breakthrough. Um, our radiology, our college of radiology or radiologists is constantly lobbying the government to try and get rebates so we can get patients onto the magnet from a GP referral. And so it was a big breakthrough getting um, the brain scans, C-spine scans, and then the knees, which is fantastic for adults. Um, but what I will say is um, an MRI in Australia is, I think, almost the cheapest in the world. Um, you're getting 30 minutes on a $2 million machine. Um, you've got two techs watching over you who are professionals and you've got a radiologist in the background and for the order of sort of somewhere about 300 or so dollars, you're getting an amazing product. Um, also, the reporting quality in Australia is exceptional. And we have um, American, uh, sorry, college uh, kids in a, in a, who are working or studying in America who fly home to Australia to get their MRIs on their sporting scholarships because it's cheaper to fly home get the MRI in Australia and fly back to America with their results, where the MRI is going to be $2,000. Um, so unfortunately, no rebate for allied health, but you can explain to your patient the value they're getting uh, in a non-rebatable scan. And um, it's incredible, it's mind blowing what they're actually getting for that, uh, that, for that money, yeah. Okay, well, we, uh, I might have to leave the questions there and any questions we haven't answered, uh, we'll put to Thomas later and he can uh, respond uh, to them. So thank you very much, Thomas, for a very informative and uh, uh, interesting talk. And I think that we uh, really all uh, gained something from that that will help us uh, knowing what we're doing better as far as radiology is concerned uh, with our patients with knees. So I'd like to thank everyone for being part of this and to remind everyone that in two weeks time, uh, we're going to have uh, IMED present uh, the third of the tri-series uh, related to shoulder imaging, uh, the joint that I find the most difficult. So I'll uh, thank you, Thomas, and uh, I'll go back to Sue now. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. O'Shea, for the very informative presentation tonight. And thank you, Dr. Perlstein, for facilitating. Who would have thought that sticky notes can be put to such good use? Um, the props were amazing, so thanks for that. Um, I would also like to thank you, our audience, for joining us tonight. Um, I look forward to your feedback, so, that, so can I ask you to please stay on the line where you'll be redirected shortly to complete your evaluation of tonight's presentation.